Um, I assume I should proceed. Yes, please. Very good. So, as I said, we you should think of measurements as probability distribution, which really should not be anything too uh, striking to you, because really measurements are in general probability distribution. They're they're an average over an ensemble of events, and you have you'll have some distribution. You'll compute the mean and you'll compute the size constant. So the mean is, and and the, the the standard deviation are already just moments of a normal distribution that you get by compare by accumulating data. Now, there's one salty, which is of course that you have other uncertainties than CSGO ones. You have systematic uncertainties as well, which are often relatively difficult to evaluate. It's a significant amount of work for every analysis to really evaluate properly systematic uncertainties. And these don't have to be normally disputed. Often they are not. Now we will make the assumption that they are. Um, and it's somewhat the simplifying assumption that we make. In general, it should be a reasonable one, but I have to emphasize it's not, it's not necessarily, it's not obvious. I mean, th there might be case where this, this could introduce uh, issues. Um, but I'd say in general, it's actually a, a good assumption. Now, what we, what we do is say that the probability distribution for some observable, so it's a V2, will be some normal distribution where the value, the, the mean that is measured is, is here. So it will be the mean of your V2. The uncertainty will enter into the covariance matrix. And so you're literally saying that your measurement every single measurement you look at is a probability distribution. Now, what you want to do is do the same thing for your model, actually. And maybe this is less intuitive, but think of it this way. Your model always has uncertainties. Now, these can be status quo uncertainties, just like for measurements, you may be obtaining your observable by averaging over a number, for example, different, a different number of, of heavy end collisions. So you have finite statistical uncertainty. You can also have numerical uncertainties that often you can reduce arbitrarily small with enough CPU time. But the, the benefit of actually considering your model prediction as a probability distribution is that you, uh, I mean, really seeing your, your model prediction as a probability distribution is that you can account for this uncertainty and it, you don't need to drive your model uncertainty to zero. You just need to take it into account and it will be propagated properly onto your parameters. And when I say you may not want to reduce your numerical uncertainty to zero anyway, think of it as you're comparing with data that has 10% uncertainty in general, 10% status quo or systematic uncertainty in general. Even if you evaluate your model to 10 digits of precision, you gain nothing at all. Really, what you want is um, essentially you have your, your errors combined. And if you want to be extremely efficient, you don't want, you don't necessarily want your numerical or statistical error to be asymptotically smaller than the experimental observable that you have. So there's some trade off, you have to be careful. Um, but what you end up doing is considering your model prediction as a probability distribution. And again, um, you just write it uh, as this Gaussian. Here I use the notation. So G is the prediction of an observable in your model given the parameters P. So again, the parameters can be viscosities, initial condition parameters. And here, this would be, this is not your model itself in a sense, but it's the output of your model. And again, you have this, um, this covariance matrix that encode the says uncertainty. So if you have a single, if you have a single observable, so these will be, you know, uh, scalars. And then this inverse CT will just be one over sigma squared, where sigma would be for example, the, the width, the, the standard deviation of your distribution here. Now, if you have a multi-valued output, which is the case for almost every model, you have multi-CV2 of different species, 
So you simply have, so these are vectors. These become vectors and this becomes a matrix. And this matrix can encode both in the theory case, and if I go back to a previous slide, in the exponential case, it can encode as well correlation, non-trivial correlation between your, uh, between the uncertainties of your observables. Now, what you can obtain by combining this probability distribution from the data and from the, uh, from your model is what is called the likelihood. So likelihood is the probability of obtaining a certain value for your observable. So D here's the data given the parameters. And it takes this form. So if you follow this distribution that I showed, you, you get this, which is essentially data minus your predict the prediction of your model. Here you have the experimental and theoretical covariance matrix that are adding up. And this is simply, most likely you can recognize this form, simply your, your chi-square here. And it comes from the assumption that the, um, your probability distributions are for the model and for the data are, no, are normal, they're Gaussian. Now, essentially what you will, will end up doing in a Bayesian analysis is evaluating over and over again this uh, e to the minus chi-square over two. Now, this seems deceivingly simple. It looks simple because it looks like a single number, but of course, it's a function of your model parameters. So if you have 14 parameters, you have a 14 dimensional probability distribution. This becomes very, uh, very rapidly uh, difficult to handle. And also your model can be uh, numerically expensive or it can have complicated dependence on the parameters. So Evaluating this is as simple as, it, as simple as it looks is actually quite non-trivial and most of the challenge of doing a Bayesian analysis is um, calculating the model, calculating this likelihood and projecting this likelihood in different dimensions. So I'll come back to this in a few slides. JF, quick question on that slide. Yes. Um, the fact that CE and CT add up uh, is an assumption or can be demonstrated? It can be demonstrated. I can send a, uh, I'll just send a reference uh, that shows how to do this uh, properly. But this is, this is exact, yes. So, all right, so this is the likelihood. So it gives you the probability of the, data given the parameters. And we want exactly the opposite. We want the probability of the parameters given the data. And that's given by uh, the, essentially what is Bayes' theorem, so conditional probability. So the probability of the, uh, the, parent, the probability of the data given the parameters times the probability of the parameters is the same as the probability of the parameter given the data times the probability of the data. Now, this is, this is uh, one way to express, to write Bayes' theorem. These are our inputs, so this comes from the model. I'll come back to the prior in a few minutes. So, so what we're interested in is this quantity, or at least what I'll be discussing today is this quantity, is the posterior. Now the posterior, as you can see, is simply proportional to the prior times the likelihood. Um, so this is what we'll ultimately be evaluating. Now, let me say a word about here, the evidence, the normalization. So I'm assuming here, which is often what we do in the field, um, that we are happy with our model. We think that, or we know that our model can describe the data reasonably well. And we want to know, given that our model can describe the data relatively well, what is the probability of different parameters different sets of power to describe the data. So what we're interested in, in a sense, is the relative probability of the different sets of power to describe the measurement. We're not necessarily interested in the absolute probability because again, we're happy with uh, the quality of agreement of our model with data. Now, this quality is, um, is related to the evidence. And if you haven't checked beforehand, or if you have any reason to believe that your model does not provide a satisfactory description of the data, 
you have to start with the evidence. The evidence is extremely important. And in a sense, it becomes a little more complicated because if you're not happy with the agreement of your model with data, then the question becomes more, um, what is the competition? So, so it becomes more a question of comparing models than to look at the absolute uh, power of your model to describe the data. So if, you're, so if your model cannot describe the data, the question is more, what, what is maybe a better model that could describe the data? And how, you know, what is the evidence for these different models? Um, now, again, I will, I will be moving forward with just the, uh, I'll, I'll be assuming, as is the case in Heavy Encalage, that we're happy with our description of the data, and we just want to constrain the parameters themselves. Now I sneaked in this this prior, right? So so this is really the, the challenge in a sense from the numerical point of view and the theoretical point of view. But this prior is also extremely important. Now I see some, um, I don't know if there's some questions. I see some things popping up on the, on the Zoom chat. Um, I will just repeat that if you have any question, I don't know what's happening on the Zoom chat. If you have any question, we recommend that you use the Slack. Now this prior, it, it is meant to encode any previous knowledge you have about, you have about the model parameters. So it's, it's hard to give a um, satisfactory description of a prior that will make everyone happy because it is somewhat of a, um, it's, it's, uh, it's a difficult, discussion to have. It's difficult to define exactly, it's, and it's not really possible to say that you have a, a perfect prior. But it's possible to give very simple examples why you need a prior. For example, a prior will encode information, for example, about the positivity of your parameters. So, so you know that, for example, a neutron width, a viscosity, um, will have to be positive definite. So you don't want your model to probe any region where this parameter is non-zero is is negative, and you don't want any of your posterior. You don't want your posterior to have any weight in regions where you know your model is completely nonsensical. So this kind of positivity constraint you can have in your prior, and you can simply have it. Your prior could simply be a step function, where you have, you know, the minimum of the step function is zero for the viscosity or for the uniform width. So you never have to worry about essentially your posterior giving a nonsensical uh, results for you know, possible parameters that would, be, that would be consistent with data. You can encode previous knowledge about from, from for example, in a sense from other experiments. So for example, when you're trying to understand how two neutrons collide, how two nucleus collide and how they deposit energy, you usually need information about the neutron width. So essentially what is the over what area you will deposit energy when there's a nucleon nucleon collision. Now you don't necessarily want to take this input from, you know, for example, you don't necessarily want to use the proton radius measure in some other experiment as a nucleon width, because that's not necessarily exactly what you're trying to do. That's not necessarily the same quantity. But you do expect some correlation. I mean, nobody would expect that nucleon width is two, three, four for me in a, when you, you're trying to model a, a neutron neutron collision happening into a heavy end collision. So this is insight that you can use into your priors to you know, constrain reasonable values of, of the neutron width. And it doesn't have to be a step function. It could be something that decreases. So for example, you, you don't, it could be flat. Your prior could be relatively flat for small values of nucleon width and then suddenly slowly decrease and then maybe hit zero at some point. So it can take various shapes. You can have other, uh, you can have other information from theory that is used in your prior and you can have also some self-consistency issue. So if you know that your model is only valid when some parameter is small, you probably don't even want to probe your, your model for large values. Because in a sense, you're, you're pushing your model in regions of a parameter space where it's providing unreliable answer. 
So all of this can be used into defining a prior. Now it doesn't tell you exactly what shape it should be. The rule of thumb is you have to use something that is reasonable. So, so you want something that, if you don't have a lot of information, you don't want your prior to drop to zero anywhere that you believe it should be non-zero. Um, I will keep the prior discussion to this for now. If you have questions, we can discuss it later, or I invite you to ask them um, in Slack as well. Now, I don't know if there's been any question up to now that are worth